Well, I want to uh, add my welcome. Uh, this is really, I believe, strongly in teacher wor training workshops such as this. I second the importance of what uh, Paul and Monica were saying about the importance of understanding and educating the public, not just school children, about China. China is increasingly important to the US, though I think it doesn't get the attention it deserves either in our school curricula or in the news media. Media coverage, and this is what uh, one of the points that Monica was making, seems virtually always to focus on the negative aspects. And indeed, much of what passes as news about China, both domestically and on the international stage, is a matter of great concern to the US and the rest of the world. Issues such as human rights, economic competition, industrial espionage, of great concern down here in the valley, cyber hacking and cyber warfare, outflow of currency, lack of affordable housing in the Bay Area, potential threats to our allies and friends, migration, human trafficking, environmental de degradation, just to name a few of the topics that I think we associate with China based on uh, our following the media. It's hard to put these stories in a positive light or to ignore them. I just came, came back from Beijing last Thursday, and the China I experienced was very different from the China I had been reading about in the media, both foreign media and Chinese media. So one point is there is no one China. The purpose of this workshop is not to pass judgment, but to raise important questions and provide, if not answers, at least ways to think about issues, as well as to indicate that China is, well, complicated. We may have certain impressions about it, which reduce it to simple binaries, friend or foe. I get, this all this, I get asked this all the time. Well, is China our friend or is China our foe? Is China a traditional country or a modern country? Is China hidebound or is it revolutionary? Is it a totalitarian dictatorship or an unstable possible democracy? All of these people think of China in these, in these binary uh, terms. The two mor morning panels feature both academics and practitioners to discuss many of these issues in the context of exploring how China is constantly in the midst of change at many levels. I think that one of your main takeaways to, will be to appreciate, to repeat, there's no single China, but that it operates at many levels. And to use the old cliche, explaining China is like the blind men describing the elephant. We began planning this workshop in the aftermath of the so-called umbrella movement, which paralyzed much of Hong Kong last fall. The previous spring, 2014, had seen large student demonstrations in Taiwan. In fact, for the past several years, there have been numerous student-led demonstrations in both of these societies, which from one angle have been directed against policies of their own governments, but from another angle are directed at Beijing. And what they see is Beijing's deepening efforts to assert control over their societies and integrate them closely with the mainland. Tomorrow, we'll hear an interview with one of the leaders of the umbrella movement, Joshua Wang. As we meet, uh, as we meet right here, there are student demonstrations underway in Taiwan over issues of textbooks used in high schools. Although we don't hear as much about it, there have also been ongoing protests throughout China as well, addressing a variety of different issues. They have been led and joined by people from different sectors of society, depending on the issues involved. What I want to talk about here, uh, in getting, getting to the, the, my main lecture, is the role of youth in Chinese protests. The first point to make is that understanding contemporary China and the rhetoric used both by the leadership and within society requires historical context. Chinese have talked for many decades about China's quest for modernity, for wealth and power, for rejuvenation, and now for realizing the China dream. And youth have a central role to play in this mission. Now, how do I um, get myself moving here? What do I aim this at? Vicky, what do I aim at? Oh, there I am, okay. <laughs> Just aim it, at, aim it at anything? I won't play around, I better get moving here. Um, yeah, so I called this talk, uh, uh, originally our workshop was going to focus more explicitly on protest. And so when I submitted my title, uh, I had protest in the title, so it's, uh, it's, it's still there. So I want to talk about, uh, I'm, I'm structuring this in two major historical um, uh, protests that have helped to shape 
both modern China and the way we think about China. What, which one of these? Do? Oh, okay, the right one. Okay, I thought the green. Now, one phrase that is used a lot, uh, has been used a lot historically over the last hundred plus years with China is this idea of the quest for wealth and power. And we have to situate this in the mid-19th century. For those of you who've been subjected to my talks the last couple of years, I talk about um, uh, the past is always present, that in order to understand China today, you have to understand history. And uh, I have to, I'm sorry to keep beating that over the head, but I, I, I believe it very firmly. Uh, in the, so let's take ourselves back to the middle of the 19th century. This was the latter part of the Qing dynasty. Now you probably know that there, or maybe you've been confused by the fact that there are a number of different romanization systems for turning Chinese words into Roman letters. So Qing is, used to be C-H-I-N-G, or some, sometimes with the apostrophe, but now the new romanization system, which is based on the pinyin system, which is standardized uh, in mainland China, it's Q-I-N-G. The Qing Dynasty from 1644 to 1911 had been created and run by Manchus, one of China's minority nationalities based up in northeastern China on the border with um, Russia and with uh, Korea. So in the middle of the 19th century, you had this traditional dynastic decline. All the dynasties in China had gone through these periods of rise and then fall. So by the middle of the 19th century, the Qing Dynasty was on the downward slope. But at that time, you had a lot of new factors which, which ex uh, exacerbated and accelerated the dynastic decline. One was humiliating military defeats by Western and Japanese imperialists. This was new. Chinese dynasties had been overthrown by non-ethnic Hans before, such as the Manchus and the Mongols. But now you had a new type of barbarian. You had these Western barbarians, plus you had Japanese barbarians who had always been considered inferior uh, civilizationally by the Chinese. But now you had, the, you had these Westerners and you had the rise of the Japanese, plus you had a devastating internal civil war on a, on a magnitude which had never been seen in China before in, in terms of peasant unrest and, and, uh, and, and revolutions. That was called the Taiping, sometimes referred to Taiping Rebellion, sometimes the Taiping Revolution lasted from 1850 to 1864, so it overlapped with the American Civil War. So by the, in the middle of the 19th century, you had all of these just terrible things that were happening in China, both from domestic unrest and uh, external invasion, which meant that many people within China, in the leadership and within society, were asking, how can China recover its unity, its autonomy from foreign imperialism, and its greatness? China had, been, had fallen apart before and dynasties had re, been, had been, new dynasties had been established. But this was an unprecedented set of challenges. So many people were asking, where should we look for ideas, for models, for goals, for what China should be like? And that's where we get to this astoundingly interesting and to this day still major subject of research, the so-called May 4th Movement. The Qing Dynasty collapsed uh, at the end of 2000, uh, at the end of 1911, the Republic of China, Asia's first republic, was established on January 1st, 1912. But almost immediately, the country fell apart into warlords, warlordism, which meant that you had all of these military types uh, who were divided the country among themselves, and, and still you also had foreign uh, occupiers in other parts of the country. So China, with all of this enthusiasm, this optimism about a republic, almost immediately fell back into chaos. The high hopes of many people, especially urban youth, for a modern republic were dashed by this chaos on top of the continued system of extraterritoriality. This was a structure, a result of imperialism, whereby foreigners enjoyed all sorts of rights and privileges on Chinese soil and were not subject to Chinese law. So not only did you have imperialists, you had occupying armies, you had these settlements of foreigners in cities like Shanghai and Wuhan uh, and Fuzhou and elsewhere, uh, elsewhere in the country where foreigners were not subject to Chinese law. Students uh, had tra traditionally uh, been 
students were people that were the small minority, a small elite of the country, who were being cultivated as future members of the scholar official class. Under the Confucian system, China invented civil service exams so that people who got education were being tracked to take the civil service exams and then enter the elite scholar official class. So students, very small minority of the, uh, of the population, uh, had this sense of, of mission, that they were going to staff the bureaucracy, they were going to set a moral example for the, for the masses. But with the collapse of Confucianism along with the dynasty and the civil service system, students were sort of cast adrift. There was a lot of criticism of Confucianism. Many people felt that Confucianism, tradition, is what had held China back. That China needed a whole new set of values, a whole new way, new ways of governance, new ways of organizing society, new things to study uh, in school. And that's where there began to be this huge interest in modern science and technology. During the 19th century, Mr. and then the early 20th century, Mr. Science and Mr. Democracy. How can we learn from the countries that have successfully modernized, including Japan, in order to save China and to help China regain its greatness? So a lot of students went abroad. This was very important. Traditionally, the Chinese felt China equaled civilization. We have nothing that we can learn from anybody else. People come to us to learn. But now you have this major reversal of Chinese saying, we really have to get our act together. We have to see how these other countries, including Japan, which had always been inferior to us, are, are becoming so modernized, so industrialized. The Japanese able to stand off the Western imperialists. Uh, what can we learn from them? So a lot of students went abroad, especially to Japan, but also to the US. Also, many, pe many young Chinese studied in new schools, which were established by Western missionaries in China. You had a whole system of, 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 of modern uh, high, uh, elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, and universities established by missionaries. Part of it, of course, was to spread Christianity, but part of it was to spread Western learning. So the impact of these missionary schools cannot be understated. A lot of Chinese, in, the, in addition to going to Japan and the US to study, went to France, especially during World War I, to, as worker students. They supplanted, they sub, su, uh, substituted for a lot of the French working class, which was, in, which was fighting the war. And many of them, uh, they, wor they worked and they also studied in France. And many of them, such as people like Deng Xiaoping and Zhou Enlai, leaders of the Communist Revolution, were radicalized during this period of World War I in France. So some of these people came back, and the center of, of intellectual ferment and excitement was Beijing University, uh, uh, abbreviated known as Beida which at that time was located northeast of the Forbidden City. So for those of you who've been to Beijing, if you've been to Beijing University, you know now that it's way the hell out in the northwest part of the city uh, where Tsinghua University and many, many other universities are located. But at that time, if you think of the Forbidden City here, Beijing University, Beida, was, was very close to the Forbidden City. Um, so during this period, especially centered at Beida, you had all of these attacks on Chinese tradition and advocacy of new ideas from the outside. Now, what was the May 4th movement? What happened on May 4th, 1919? This was one event when a group of patriotic students assembled at Tiananmen, which is the southern gate of the Forbidden City. So if we think of the Forbidden City, Tiananmen is down here. Beijing University was up here. So nowadays, when you think, well, I'll get to 1989 in a couple of minutes, the students had to march from here, way up here, all the way down to Tiananmen Square, uh, or take buses. But in 1919, they, sort of, they just had to go around this way, much closer. They assembled at the southern gate of the Forbidden City to attack pro-Japanese officials. First of all, you didn't have that giant plaza in those days. And many of the government offices were located there as well. Patriotic students assembled at Tiananmen to attack officials in their government who they saw as being pro-Japanese after the Treaty of Versailles, it was revealed that some of these, uh, that after the Treaty of Versailles, when there was this advocacy of self-determination by President Wilson, many of these young Chinese who had studied in the US, studied abroad, said now the foreigner imperialists are going to support our recovery of autonomy, our unity. They're going to remove their imperialist forces. They're going to end extraterritoriality. But what happened? Secret deals were made by Chinese officials with the Japanese 
who took over territory which had been occupied by the Germans in Shandong province, up in, uh, but because the Germans lost World War I, those territories, instead of being given back to China, were given to, to the Japanese. So this was seen as a double betrayal, extra humiliation by all of these foreign powers. So students became highly politicized. And on May 4th, many of them attacked uh, Chinese officials for their, for their perfidy. Many of them, not only this attack was, uh, happened on May 4th, but this May 4th refers to a movement which lasted approximately 1917, some would date it even earlier, to 1921, of unprecedented mass mobilization, intellectual ferment, exploration, and experimentation. Many of the students who had been elite, the elite of China, they considered themselves bound for the leadership elite of the country. They broke out of the small number of universities which existed at that time, and they became integrated with merchants, with workers, girls got involved in this, so that they finally, they broke out of this elite in bubble and became much more integrated into Chinese society. So the period of 1917 to 1921 is known as a period of unprecedented mass mobilization, intellectual ferment, exploration, experimentation. And one of the things that happened during the period of the May 4th movement was the Russian Revolution. So some Chinese youth became extremely influenced by Marxism-Leninism and the Bolshevik Revolution. That here you had people in another downtrodden country which was, had been victimized by foreign forces, had got their act together because of this ideology of Marxism-Leninism. And so the Soviet Union was an extremely attractive uh, model for many young Chinese. They felt betrayed by the West, betrayed by the Japanese, the Soviet Union was what inspired them. So to this day, the May 4th movement is an inspiration. It's, a, it's an inspiration to Chinese young people uh, and to Chinese intellectuals as well as the spark which opened up, the, opened up the doors to the Communist Revolution. The Communist Party was established officially on July 1st, 1921, right in the midst of this. So the May 4th movement has this resonance of not only the rise of communism, but of nationalism, of rejuvenation, and of patriotism. So when we look at protests in China today, one of the things that people constantly refer to is the May 4th Movement. Now then, jumping ahead from 1919 to 1989, seven years, 70 years later, I think very few of us were around in 1919. Uh, but looking around the room, I know I was around in 1989. Um, I think many, many people here were not quite uh, maybe not paying attention to world affairs in 1989. But certainly for those of us, especially myself, uh, as, as someone who's, whose life is in, inextricably intertwined with China and who, who was on the Berkeley campus at that time, 1989, the whole period of May, April, May, and June of 1989 left indelible Im images of an extremely complex series of events. So June 4th, like May 4th, is one date where there was a major mm -hmm. event but it refers to an entire period of ferment, of questioning, of exploration about what should China's path forward be. And it's important to remember that the uh, May 4th, uh, June 4th, the events leading up to uh, June 4th, took place during and after the commemorative events of the 70th anniversary of the May 4th movement. Every, t every year, there are conferences to discuss the significance of the May 4th movement in China. University campuses, think tanks, academies of social science always have meetings to discuss the May 4th movement. But especially in a 10 year, like 79, 89, and so on, there are big, large scale events to commemorate the, the May 4th movement and to discuss what is, it, what is its relevance for today. So during the demonstrations of 1989, many of the young people referred to the May 4th movement that we are the inheritors of this period of protest where our forefathers and foremothers were asking these questions about what should China's path forward be. The students saw themselves, even in 1989, uh, uh, 70 plus years after the founding of the Communist Party, uh, 30 years after the founding of the, uh, I mean, 40 years after the founding of the People's Republic of China, still in this sense of, tr in this traditional way 
of students have been meritocratically selected. We're the elite because we did well, not on civil service exams, but on what the Chinese equivalent of the SAT, called the Gaokao. Because China's, educa China's system of progression through the education system is based on how well you do on exams. So it's, the students felt, if I got into Beijing University, if I got into Tsinghua University, it's because I'm really smart, I work really hard, I did well on these tests. So I deserve to be part of the elite. So that they felt that they had a mission to inherit the leadership of the Communist Party and of China itself. And they also felt, as their forebears did 70 years prior, that they had a patriotic duty to point out to the leadership the serious flaws in the system at present. And I should say that this is not just a question of 1989 or 1919, but throughout Chinese history, in periods of dynastic decline, intellectuals, including a lot of young people, felt that it was their responsibility to what was called remonstrate, to point out to the emperor, your bureaucracy is corrupt, the peasants are revolting, there's natural disasters, you're losing the mandate of heaven, you better get your act together. So what the students were doing in 1989 and 1919 is something that had been happening for thousands of years, is pointing out, hello, we've got a lot of problems. If you want to save the country, you better, you better get your act together. So a lot of the young people in Tiananmen Square, I was looking at some images last night, and I was, uh, wasn't able to select any that I thought were going to be particularly, it, it was hard to select just a few. So I ended up selecting none. Uh, but you can Google, Google um, uh, Tiananmen, uh, or June 4th, 1989. You'll see a lot of these images of students holding banners and then mobilizing other people in society. As in 19, 1919, they went outside of the confines of the university to talk to workers, to talk to peasants, to talk to uh, private business people, to talk to journalists, to talk to soldiers to say there are all these problems in our society that need to be dealt with, that we're facing a crisis of the loss of the mandate of heaven. At that time, you had double-digit inflation. You had ter what was at that time considered terrible corruption, though nothing to compare to the corruption you've got today. So many of the young people were saying, you, the Communist Party is betraying its ideals, or there are bad people in the party betraying its ideals. It's our responsibility as the future of China to point this out. Some of them wanted a transformation in this, of the system in the direction of Western-style democracy. And you know that many of this, in the Western media, this was portrayed as a movement for democracy. And you did have the goddess of democracy at the very end of the movement. So people latched on, around the world latched onto this as it being a movement for democracy, Western-style democracy. That was definitely one strain in the movement. But there were other students who really were not aiming at Western democracy or overthrowing the communist system or fundamentally transforming it. They wanted to purify it, which is, again, a very traditional way of looking at this. Purifying the Communist Party, saying that since the end of the Mao era in 1976, especially the beginning of the reforms in 1979, China had become increasingly corrupt, and we want to purify the Communist Party. As in the original May 4th era, Post Mao China, the period from the end of the Mao era, 19, really the beginning of the reforms in 1979, that decade, China had experienced, as in the May 4th movement, a period of intellectual inquiry, openness to the outside world, exposure to new ideas and the experience of other Asian societies. It was at this time that people in China began to learn about what had happened in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, in South Korea. And they started to ask questions, of, and of course Japan, which they'd known about before, but started to ask questions about if these places can modernize, if these places can democratize, why can't we? Why can't China? We grow out of a similar historical experience. Why are, why are they advancing so quickly and we're not? After the era of the Cultural Revolution from 1966 to 1976, when Mao had mobilized Chinese youth to purge the Communist Party and follow his dictates, in the reform era, the CCP had backed off from its efforts to control all p aspects of people's lives and gave them more space to think on their own and take some control over their own lives. I was a student in Shanghai beginning in um, February of 1979, right when this process began. And I got there in February of 1979. 
May of 1979, the 60th anniversary of the May 4th Movement. And if you know China, you know 60 years are a major cycle. So they were planning these major commemorative events of the May 4th Movement. Figures in the communist movement who had been criticized for decades had been rehabilitated. It was this period of intellectual ferment beginning in 1979, which of course ended up with uh, the tragedy of 1989. But the point is that China had opened up dramatically uh, over this period of reforms. And there was all of this asking, this questioning, this intellectual ferment, just as in 1919, about what should China's future be? How should China achieve, how can China achieve wealth and power? So that's, I will stop with this, hopefully throwing out a few things for you to think about. And sorry for talking so fast, I overprepared and I've had too much coffee. <laughs> Strong coffee <laughs> that I made myself. And, um, and so now I'm going to turn the, the panel over to our other speakers who will talk about more specific examples of how China's society has changed, how it's opened up to the outside world, what the influences of this have been, and possible directions of future change. So thank you very much for your attention. Oh.